Good day everyone, I'm Bite Nibble Chomp, or Ryan, the developer of Strategic Command American Civil War, and today we'll be starting a multiplayer series against Gaming of the Colonel. This is a effectively our first game of multiplayer for the new DLC that we're releasing called Wars in the Americas, which has five campaigns in it, of which um, one 1898 Remember the Main is going to be covering the Spanish-American War. That's the one we'll be playing today. I'm going to be playing the Spanish and the Colonel is going to be taking the Americans. Let's set our options. So I'll be playing with the 3D counters, the um, loose sprites. Um, uh, I've always liked them. In fact, they were probably some of the things that drew me to Strategic Command when I was about nine years old, um, long before I was thinking of developing a game. Um, so, Spain starts in a very tricky spot. They've been at war with the Cuban uh, partisans, they're called in the game, um, gone by a nu number of names, um, depending on your perspective. Um, Mambises, they called themselves. Um, so, they have been in revolt, trying to throw off the um, Spanish occupation of Cuba. Um, the campaign begins on February 12th when General Maximo Gomez effectively called for all Cubans to unite into a single sort of revolutionary army against the Spanish. Um, before then, it sort of been local riots that, like that, they were all trying to achieve the same goal but weren't exactly working together while doing so. Um, so, we've got a few pop ups to begin with. Um, they're saying the situation in the colonies, Cuba, the Philippines, etc., has greatly deteriorated and the senior advisors believe that complete victory over the rebels may no longer be possible. Which is pretty accurate. By 1898, Spain, even before the Americans got involved in the war, Spain had effectively lost. The, um, the Cubans were never going to accept Spanish rule henceforth. The Filipinos, they had they were at a truce at the beginning of the campaign in February of 1898, but they'd been in revolt a couple of years earlier as well. Um, so this map we've divided into five sections, the Philippines, California, Florida and the Caribbean, the Canary Islands and Spain. And then each, there's these loot boxes here and here, and then there's others in the different sections um, where you can move ships between one and the other. Um, so, a big part of the strategy in this campaign is going to be positioning your forces correctly before the war even begins. Obviously, the um, Americans got involved in late April, which is eight or nine turns after the beginning of the campaign. Before then, the Americans, or more correctly, the United States will have to choose first what units to purchase and then where to deploy them because once a unit's committed to say Florida it's very hard to then move it all the way over to the Philippines which is the other side of the world. So in Cuba we've got to defend Havana, San Fuegos and Santiago de Cuba which have been marked with red stars. I mark all victory objectives with red stars in Civil War campaigns so that should be familiar. And then Morro Castle which is a uh, well I suppose in the earlier times it was a castle. In Havana is our primary supply source. If we lose that, we're going to be in a world of strife. Um, there's lots of partisans in Cuba, so they're also saying we should um, position our forces in the interior. That's easier said than done, as I'll show you in a minute. In the Philippines, we've also got to maintain five warships near the port of Cavite, which is next to Manila. If we don't do this, then the Philippines will also start spawning partisans, which will be almost impossible to defend against. Historically, the Philippine revolutionaries took over the, most of the islands within about three months of um, the Americans getting involved, and Spain really couldn't do anything about it. The Spanish garrison is coalesced around Manila, there's no supply pretty much anywhere else, so it's barely worth even defending all this outlying stuff. The best way to do it is to hold on to Manila Bay and the surrounding areas. It's worth noting that Admiral Dewey's squadron may appear up here in Hong Kong, or 
the Americans make shoes to send it to California and then they can send it to fighting Cuba instead. Um, here's Morro Castle, which we have to hold at all costs. It's very valuable. Havana is quite capable of defending itself with the forces immediately around it as long as we can hold the supply source, but if we lose the supply source, Havana's pretty much done. We've also got all these um, outlying garrisons. We may decide to bring them closer to our victory objectives because obviously to win the campaign, we've got to hold on to at least three of Havana, San Fuegos, San Iago, which is here, um, San Juan Puerto Rico, which is there, or Manila. If we lose one or two, we're going to be in trouble because our fighting spirit is pretty weak. But as long as we hold at least two, or at least three rather, then we'll, we will win the campaign if we last until December of 1898. The assumption being that if the war goes on that long, the Germans get involved and Spain negotiates some honourable peace. Actual military victory for Spain, probably impossible. Most of our, our garrisons on land are not too bad, but our navy is about 20 years out of date and is going to be in a lot of trouble, pretty much against anything that the Americans send. Historically, the Americans only lost two men defeating the Spanish Navy, at least as far as the two big battles are concerned. And one of those deaths was from heatstroke, of all things. So, in the campaign, the Spanish Navy's a bit better than it was historically, but that is a very low bar to clear. So, as we can see, we've got a lot of our garrisons sort of spread out all over the place at the moment. This is why. There's partisans can appear pretty much every third tile in Cuba. So, how much effort we spend on defending against the partisans versus on the victory objectives can have a big impact on our eventual outcome of the war because we draw most of our income as the Spanish from the colonies. Um, Cuba probably being the most valuable. Puerto Rico's not too bad. The Philippines isn't worth a lot, except there is a lot of value in the fighting spirit. As we can see, at the moment the Philippine revolutionaries are quiet, we don't have to worry about them right now, but we will later. Um, so I'll put them away. We have got an option in the campaign to put little flags on the hexes that have partisans. I haven't enabled it for this game, but you can do that if you choose when you're playing it yourself. This is Admiral Severa's squadron, which historically was sent to Santiago and ultimately got really badly defeated there. Um, so one of our biggest choices right at the beginning is do we send it to Cuba as historically, or perhaps Puerto Rico, which is not too far from Cuba. This is about two turns sailing in the game. Or we can alternatively send it to the Philippines, which might make keeping the five ships around here easier. As I noted when I was showing the pop-up, the Philippine Revolution, we called it, um, I think that's one of the names it goes by historically, will trigger. This is sort of a tripwire, so if, if it happens once, that's it. Philippine Revolutionaries continue for the rest of the game. That happens the moment there's fewer than five Spanish ships here. We only have six at the moment, if we send Severa, we can potentially make that 12. We've also got a battleship here, which if the Colonel chooses to do the historical strategy of send Admiral Dewey's squadron and nothing else, that battleship will be a lot stronger than anything that the Colonel sends in theory. Technologically, the Americans are vastly superior to us, so this battleship might be only the equal of a cruiser. So what I'm going to do to begin is I'm going to pull this outlying garrison in northern Luzon. I'm going to send him south. Hopefully I'll remember to do that every turn because I want to get him to join the garrison around Manila. We really can't afford to lose Manila um, because the objective there, in addition to being a victory objective, it's worth a ton of fighting spirit. As I noted, we don't really have enough fighting spirit to do anything. Um, Bit of an exaggeration, but we are in a lot of trouble. 
we've also got another um, garrison here in Iloilo. I haven't decided what I'm going to do with him for now. Hopefully I don't forget to and just leave him there. Um, so let's look at what we've got in Cuba. So this is one of the many, many partisans we're going to have to deal with. Um, the Spanish army is quite capable against the partisans. The partisans, of course, not being a regular army, they're um, effectively just the native population taking up whatever arms they can get a hold of, and y usually they just attack the Spanish convoys of men and supplies that sort of came past their, their farms and the like, um, rather than engaging in open battle. Alright, we've got General Parado here. I'll just see if I can't move him somewhere where he'll be a bit less vulnerable. I'll put him there. Can't move him this turn. That's... Well, we're off to a terrible start already. <laughs> Didn't think my moves through quite as well as I should. Um, Alright, well, let's put this cavalry here then. Maybe attacking that partisan wasn't the best idea I've ever had. You'd think after developing the campaign I'd have memorised where all the partisans spawn. <laughs> I haven't. There's a lot of them. Um. One thing I would like to try and do is maintain a line of supply between Havana and San Fuegos. Um, i.e. no partisans owning a complete line across here. Reason being, as long as we control a direct line there, then San Fuegos is going to have full supply. Supply in Cuba, particularly for the Americans, is somewhere between abysmal and non-existent. So, if we can maintain supply around our victory objectives, it's going to be much harder for the Americans to dislodge us. One thing I do sometimes like to do is bring the units on the, what was called the Troca, a fortified line here. I like to coalesce them around San Fuegos. If there's a strong force here, it can be quite tough to dislodge, particularly if we also hold Trinidad. Again, supply issues being the, the big factor here. Though the other thing we've got to think about is Puerto Princip over here. As long as we hold this, the Cubans have a maximum of three or five supply, depending on if they're able to capture Guantanamo or connect a line to their supply source here. But if they capture Puerto Princip, then they can get primary supply, or effectively eight, everywhere that they have a direct line of control from here, which will very soon be most of the island. Um, it's worth noting, the position we start with, with all these partisans everywhere, this is the best that Cuba's ever going to look like for Spain. It only gets worse because more and more, more and more of this happens. <laughs> so what I will do immediately is pull two of my garrisons here. The Troca in the first Cuban insurrection in 1868 to 78, the Troca was actually quite effective in keeping the rebellions restricted to one side of the island. Um, past tense, not in this one. They've already broken through in a number of places. They're going to they're, they're going to ignore the Troca. It's not really worth anything, and it's pretty much impossible to keep a line of supply between, say, San Fuegos and San Yoko de Cuba. I'm not even going to try and defend it, I don't think it's worthwhile. Um, that said, when the campaign releases, I encourage you to try and do it. You might be able to do it with the right strategy. I've, I've never been able to make it work, but of course developing the campaign doesn't necessarily mean you know everything about it. You only know everything but how it starts. Alright, I'm going to pull this unit down to here, and uh, 
Already, I'm quite wary of the Colonel doing something... Something sneaky if I... Position my garrison's in the wrong place. The partisans themselves aren't too much of a threat, but if they gain control of an area, can be tough to dislodge them. We don't have a lot of cavalry. The cavalry I do have. You know what? I'm going to send it over here. It might be more useful to keep control of this area than leaving it in what's going to be effectively a giant garrison. Um, I don't expect to do anything more than barely hold on to this position here. Not going to try. Um, Spain doesn't have resources to spare on everything that would be nice to do. It's got to concentrate on what what's most urgent to do. Another thing worth doing is keeping your HQs in the supply sources themselves. Of course the cities have supply of 8. The jungles around them have less than that and doesn't take a long time for supply to decay. This is actually quite nice looking supply, but if we go to somewhere like, well, let's take the Philippines, you see how quickly it deteriorates. We've got to be careful about where we position our, position our forces. Ah, don't want supply, I want partisans. Well, I don't want partisans, I want to know where they are. Um, you'd think I'd remember something like that. No. <laughs> I tend to be a rather aggressive player when I play these games. Um, gotta be careful that doesn't result in me just making silly, foolish mistakes. Um, yes, let's do that. Let's bring our forces together and then we'll work out how we're going to deal with these partisans. Put him here for the time being, that should be a fairly safe position. Historically, this garrison in Manzanillo was able to fight its way out and reunite with the force in Santiago. I've never actually managed to do it. Um, I, I did position these forces where they were historically in February of 1898. I don't know how the Spanish commanders were able to pull it off. Um, first person to manage to do that, let me know because I'd really like to be able to do it. I've never managed it. Um, Yes, that should hold off some of our some of our foes. The colonel's going to be coming off a crafty strategy to dislodge me. These engineers here, they're going to build the defences on the San Juan Heights. Anyone knows anything about Theodore Roosevelt knows his famous charge up. Well, he said it was San Juan Hill. He actually charged up Kettle Hill, which was smaller and nearby. Um, Theodore Roosevelt himself, in the form of a Rough Riders unit, is going to be showing up at some point. I intend to deal him a lot of damage and hopefully get him, because that would be... That would do some glory to the Spanish arms. Let's see if I can't concentrate my navy um, predominantly. I I'm going to try and get them in this area between the Bahamas and Cuba. Ideally, the Colonel will send his navy through here and I can ambush a few transports. These gunboats aren't worth a lot, but if I can get a surprise attack off with them, sink an HQ or something, that'll be... that'll be quite the prize. So as I said, supply out here, it's dreadful. If we get an HQ, that probably will disrupt a entire invasion for quite a while. Yes, returning to my garrison here, I think what I'm going to do is send him back to Spain.
we can also purchase some more brigades. Um, that would be advisable, but not yet. I need to get this battleship repaired, send him on. What I've decided to do, I'm going to send all of my, or well, all of Severo's squadron to the Philippines. What I'm hoping to do is ambush the um, squadron under Admiral Dewey if the Colonel decides to do that. If I can ambush it somewhere in the South China Sea, then I'll be able to counterattack um, with my good ships and hopefully prevent him from destroying my fleet near Manila. If I can do that, I might be able to prevent the Philippine Uprising completely. Ambitious, yes. Let's see how it goes. It's a game. Go big or go home. And with that, I think that concludes my moves for turn one. So, the Colonel's going to be uploading his side of the action onto his channel, which I'll link in the description of this video. And hopefully he'll link, his, uh, link my channel in his for those that are coming across from his channel. And with that, we are done. Off to you, Colonel. And that's the main exploding. That's bad news, because the Americans are going to blame it on us. They did a, they did a study about 100 years after the main blew up to work out what actually happened. It turned out as internal combustion of the... Um, the coal in the the fuel tank, or I don't know if they called it a tank then, but yes, yeah, so it was actually a massive accident, and the Americans got their well, Theodore Roosevelt got his war effectively on the board of an accident. Um, we're going to have to deal with the consequences. So. Watch the Colonel's turn shortly on his channel, or stay tuned for my turn too in due course.